What's up you guys? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Danielle Hallen and I am back with another true crime video. And today we have a very interesting update that I personally believe is pretty relevant in regards to the disappearance of Fawn Marie Mountain. You guys, I covered Fawn a few years ago at this point. I have watched her cousin battle all levels of hell to get Fawn's story out there, to ensure that there was a proper police investigation into this, to make sure all possible steps were being taken. And it's one of those cases where deep down in your gut, you just you just kind of know what's happening. Obviously, just because it seems so obvious does not mean that there's automatically going to be an arrest, that there's enough to push forward with that. But that's what makes this so frustrating. And I feel like everyone who knows about Fawn's story, who has been here and followed through her family's journey, trying to get her justice, this is a moment that we all have been waiting for. I will have the original video on Fawn's disappearance link down below, but in case you wanna just go ahead and dive into this, I will give you a brief refresher as well. Fawn Mountain disappeared from Claysburg, Pennsylvania in November of 2012, where she had been living at the time with her partner, Heather Dibert. Now, according to Fawn's family and friends, Heather and Fawn's relationship was a tumultuous one. And honestly, it came out of absolute nowhere. Their relationship moved incredibly fast and the closer Fawn got to Heather, less and less her family heard from her. Heather was described as being incredibly possessive. Not only was she thought to be playing a part in this lack of communication between Fawn and her family, but she also was controlling every other aspect of Fawn's life, it seemed. She refused to let Fawn go anywhere by her Herself, and it got to the point that Fawn spent majority of her time inside of their home in Claysburg with essentially no contact with not just her family at this point, but with anyone. During their relationship, police were called out to the home numerous times for welfare checks and in response to reports of domestic violence. And Fawn had even been hospitalized numerous times with injuries consistent with domestic violence. And just as one of the many examples that are in my original video, months prior to Fawn Fawn's disappearance, police had been called out to their home for a disturbance. And when they arrived, Heather was screaming, acting totally out of pocket, and Fawn was clearly in distress. And she admitted to police that Heather was abusive and she wanted to leave that house for her own safety, but that Heather was essentially holding her hostage. She was not allowing her to leave. But despite all of this, despite these numerous calls, these numerous welfare checks, nothing was ever really done. So the situation just progressively got worse. By 2011, out of nowhere, Fawn filed a restraining order against her own mother, Dorothy. Now, the reality is that Dorothy and Fawn had not always seen eye to eye, but this was extreme. It made no sense. And it was not something that Fawn would do on her own. And it felt like a final attempt to end all communication between Fawn and her family. Dorothy ended up not hearing from her daughter for a year and she was not able to do a thing about it. She made calls for help, but the restraining order that was in place made it seem like she was just up to no good, uh, you know, finding excuses to make some sort of contact with her daughter. And then suddenly, just a month before Fawn's disappearance, Fawn shows up out of nowhere on her mom's doorstep. According to Dorothy, Fawn was desperate for help after claiming that she got into a massive fight with Heather and she legitimately had to escape from the home and run away to free herself of it. Heather called police and reported Dorothy for breaking this restraining order, which landed Dorothy in jail for an entire weekend. And this left Fawn with nowhere to go, but back into the hands of Heather Dibert. Fawn was last seen a month later on November 25th, 2012. Heather had claimed that she and Fawn had spent a few days at her parents' butcher shop, sterilizing the whole thing after hunting season had ended, and that the night they returned from this butcher shop, Fawn allegedly ran away. But what was strange was that the numerous other times Fawn had frantically tried to escape her home with Heather, Heather went to any length possible to track her down, like to the point where she had essentially broken into a neighbor's house trying to look for Fawn. If you lived anywhere in the vicinity of Fawn and Heather's home, you knew if Fawn had left Heather because you heard it, you saw it. Heather became absolutely 
frantic. But this particular morning, she was just sitting outside of her house, casually smoking a cigarette, completely unconcerned that Fawn had run away the night before. Right away, Heather and her parents turned around and gutted the entire trailer that Fawn had allegedly vanished from, and Heather ran to another state. Eventually, she ended up back in Pennsylvania. But because of the restraining order that had been in place, the total breakdown of communication with family, no one really knew that Fawn was missing until 2015. So an investigation didn't start until three years after she was last seen. Fawn's cousin spearheaded the investigation and media efforts to try and locate Fawn and get some sort of answers because this entire situation just absolutely reeks of foul play. And Heather Dybert has a ridiculously long criminal history that just had some massive, massive additions to it. So while Fawn's case remains open and unsolved, everyone has been keeping their eye on a very particular someone to see if there's ever anything at all that may lead to answers in Fawn's disappearance. And recently, that's exactly what happened. Heather Dybert, Fawn's ex-partner, the last person she was known to be with before she disappeared, was just arrested on 32 charges in regards to a recent but very telling unrelated crime. According to reports, 43-year-old Heather Dybert hired 34-year-old Zachary Sellers to kill her most recent estranged wife. And I wish that I could sit here and tell you that I was surprised. According to the affidavit, Pennsylvania State Police received a call from one of the many victims of the situation on October 28, 2023, around 12.30 a.m. to report that there was a fire on the back deck of their home. Now, thankfully, one of the owners of the home was able to wake up her husband, and he was able to successfully put the fire out before first responders arrived. Now, when first responders arrived, they did their typical protocol. They checked the inside of the home, the outside of the home for things like electric electrical fires, typical fire starters that they would normally see. But when they started to take a closer look at the area where the fire started, they noticed something a little bit sketchy. Numerous children's toys were melted and burned on the back deck, and it appeared that the fire had started to melt the siding of the home, which indicated that it was something on the back deck that likely started the fire. And there's not like electrical things running underneath the floorboards of the back deck. And so in the midst of these half burned items, they ended up finding a melted plastic bottle containing a clear liquid. Um, this was a Molotov cocktail, meaning that this fire was an arson. There were six people in this home at the time, three of them being minors. This was terrifying. When the residents of the home were questioned, they stated that they heard a loud thump outside around 12, 15 a.m. and it was loud enough that they believed it may have been a car crash or something. So they went to scope things out and instead saw a fire in the middle of their deck. They rushed out with the fire extinguisher to try and put it out and that's when they called 911. And one of the six people living inside of this home was Heather Dybert's recent estranged wife. Now, all of their names have been redacted for privacy reasons, so we're going to call her Kelly for the sake of making this easy to understand. Kelly told authorities that she had been in a relationship with Heather Dybert for around a year, and the only person they could think of being potentially involved in an arson of their home was Heather Dybert. So Kelly ended up telling authorities that she was in a relationship with Heather Dybert for around a year, and it was not a good one. So history is again, repeating itself. She claimed that since September of 2022, so for almost the entirety of their relationship, Heather had repeatedly made death threats to her and her family. And only 10 days prior to this arson, there was a pretty big incident. She had essentially been rescued from Heather's home. On October 18th, 2023, Kelly's father went into Freedom Township Police Department in Pennsylvania with a letter that he had just received from his daughter, like a written letter. And it said, quote, 
dad, please come get me. Immediately, he felt something was very wrong. Again, there seems to be this pattern of communication being cut off to the point where this woman had to write him a physical letter. So he went to police saying, look, my daughter is at Heather's home and I'm concerned for her well-being." Police went to Heather's home to perform a welfare check and ultimately removed Kelly from the home for her own safety. And a protective order was put in place. Now that same day, Kelly and her father were at the Freedom Township Police Department, likely in regards to everything that had just happened, when they ended up seeing Heather and her mom in a car nearby, like just creepily watching them from a distance. Kelly's father claimed that at this point, Heather came over to his car absolutely losing her mind. She was repeatedly beating on the car with her fists and she was demanding to know if Kelly was leaving her. And when Kelly confirmed, yes, I am, Heather then threatened to kill her father right in front of the both of them. So obviously immediately police were notified. Heather was facing terroristic threat charges because of this, but unfortunately this didn't end up landing her in jail. Heather was out free and left to her own devices. So knowing this information, the investigation into the arson went a very, very specific way. When Kelly was questioned, she was able to tell authorities that Heather had not only threatened her life and her family's lives numerous times, but she had been terrifyingly specific about it. Heather had told her that she would get a man named Zachary Sellers to quote, do stuff to her if she left the relationship. But within just a few days of the arson, authorities managed to obtain a warrant to check Heather and Zachary's phones, and it painted a very clear picture. On October 21st, 2023, so just days after an incident at the police station and days before the arson, Heather met with Zachary Sellers at his home in Lewistown, according to all of her phone data. And between this day and October 28th, the day of the arson, the two contacted each other a total of 35 times, with 31 of those being within 24 hours of the fire being started. And their phone movements during that time literally drew out a map of their plans for authorities, like handed it over to them on a silver platter. On October 27th at around 8 p.m., hours before the arson occurred, both Dibert and Sellers' phones arrived in the area of Port Matilda, Pennsylvania within minutes of each other. So clearly they were, you know, getting together to go on and do what was about to happen. From there, they traveled together to East Freedom where they arrived just before 9 p.m. And then the two made their way to Bedford nearby where Kelly was living with her parents and three children, ultimately ending up in a location less than a mile from Kelly's home. After spending a few minutes in the vicinity of Kelly's house, Heather ends up leaving by herself, according to cell phone data, and beelines it to a strip club in West Virginia that she had been repeatedly Googling at this point. Authorities stated in the affidavit that she was clearly trying to set up an alibi for herself and going as far away as possible to do it, like literally in another state. Sellers, however, remained in the area of Kelly's home until around 11 p.m. before heading roughly seven minutes away where he just kind of sat until 1222. At this point, his phone's moving again and he is back in the vicinity of Kelly's home. He was in this area for around five minutes and left the area around the exact same time that 911 was called to report the fire. So it's pretty obvious what happened here. Within hours of all of this happening, authorities were able to find that Heather canceled her phone plan and got an entirely new number, which honestly, like, it just had me kind of giggle a little bit because she probably thought she was so smart and getting away with the whole entire thing when in reality, authorities are just reading out the events of this like a book. On December 12th, 2023, authorities put out a warrant for the arrest of Zachary Sellers in connection to the arson. And when they sat him down for questioning, he started to just give everything up. Sellers told authorities that he had known Heather for a few years at this point, and initially, just a few weeks prior to the arson, Heather had approached him asking him for some help. Heather claimed that Kelly had taken their dog. Um, she said, oh, she took my dog and I want to get my dog back. And Sellers agreed to this. But shortly after this, Heather came back to him claiming that Kelly had killed her dog. Now, obviously I've got zero information on if any of this is true. Now, according to Sellers, things switched from him going to get her dog back to Heather wanted to kill Kelly. Sellers said that they weren't able to get their hands on a gun. So instead, Heather offered him money 
and drugs if he would burn down Kelly's house. He said, quote, she wanted to burn her and well, we tried that. However, that night when he arrived, he realized that the home wasn't just occupied by Kelly. There were numerous people at the house and based on the toys in the yard and on the deck, there were kids in the home as well. But when he reached out to Heather about this saying, look, I'm not comfortable with this. There's kids in this house. Her response was quote, kill them all. Sellers told police, quote, she said they killed her baby, so we had to kill their babies. And to encourage Sellers to continue the plan, despite this new information that was causing him hesitation, Heather decided to sweeten the deal a little bit by also offering him a new car. He claimed that Heather directed him to set fire to both the front and back doors so that they would have absolutely no way to escape the house. But he said for one reason or another, he didn't end up doing that and just tried to set the back door on fire. He said that the following day, he was supposed to be paid for what he had done. But at that point, Heather had ghosted him completely. She wasn't messaging him, wasn't saying anything. After hearing all of this information from sellers, where he is implicating that he was hired to kill someone by Heather Dibert, on December 13th, Heather Dibert was arrested as well at her home on Donnertown Road. Now she initially, refused to answer the door. So they ended up having to call in a special emergency response team to finally be able to get her out and put her into custody. She was arraigned the same day and her bail was set to $1 million. Heather is now facing over 30 charges, including 12 counts of felony aggravated arson, six counts of felony conspiracy to commit aggravated arson, six counts of aggravated assault, conspiracy to commit murder, criminal homicide. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. I was reading all the charges just page after page after Bridget released them on the Facebook page for Fawn with my jaw just on the floor. Sellers is facing pretty much the exact same charges, but he only has 25 total and his bail is also set to $1 million. He ended up waiving his rights to a preliminary hearing and is currently just sitting in Bedford County Correctional Facility waiting for a trial to occur. But out of nowhere on December 19th, like a week or so later after these two arrests, articles started popping up left and right that a third person had been arrested in connection to the murder for hire plot. 33 year old Jamie Eugenia Beers of Lewistown had apparently been interviewed by police on December 12th. So around the same time they brought in Sellers because it turned out that Jamie is Sellers' girlfriend. And apparently during this interview, she confessed that she too had participated in this arson, that she had actually been the getaway driver. Now, according to Beers, she and Sellers met Dibert at a gas station, quote, far away on the 27th of October, just hours before the arson. At this point, Heather proceeded to show both Beers and Sellers where Kelly's house was located, and then Heather left to create her alibi. Beers claimed that she stayed with Sellers at a nearby state park, so once the time came, she was driving the car and she parked down the hill away from the house while Sellers walked on foot in the woods to the house to set it on fire. She also admitted that Heather offered her drugs and money to participate as well. Beers is now facing 26 conspiracy charges, including criminal homicide, and is also being held on $1 million bond. And just like Sellers, she too waived her right to a preliminary hearing. So this brings us to last Wednesday when Heather, who did not waive her right to a preliminary hearing, went in for hers. The courtroom was standing room only, filled with purple shirts. And if you know anything about Fawn's case, purple is her color. And it was shirts with her name all over it. When I tell you, I could not be happier to see that when I was looking this up, I am just like over the freaking moon about it. I'm not sure entirely what happened during this hearing, but I know that one of the main factors in all of this was that Heather's defense attorney wanted her bail lowered from $1 million to $100,000, claiming that the current amount was excessive. And when I tell you that the judge's response to this just made my entire day, I am not joking. Judge Tanya Osmond said, quote, based on the evidence, the facts, the PFAs, her history, I am more inclined to deny bail altogether because I don't believe that any amount would ensure compliance and protect the parties involved. This feels like the biggest win imaginable. That right there is an absolute statement. This judge has seen everything, connected all the dots, and does not want Heather out 
period. And so I am sure right now she is absolutely shaking in her boots. And I am hoping and praying that her being incarcerated is allowing police to question her in regards to other crimes she might be involved in, including Fawn's case. This is absolutely huge for Fawn's family. I am beyond thrilled that it seems that the victims of this more recent crime are going to get some sort of justice here. And finally, Heather's not getting away with something that she's doing. You guys, when I tell you that I have Google alerts on for this woman and I am so regularly updated with new news of her criminal activity. It's like bonkers. And I've had this on for the past, like what, three or so years since I covered this case. And even like newspapers.com, like I'll have historical records sent to me that they have found of other times that she's done something absolutely awful. And it has been so frustrating to watch her just repeatedly get away with these terrible things and threaten people and just walk away from it like nothing is going on. So at the very least, if there's no immediate answers for Fawn right now, Heather, who is a violent and dangerous person, as per her documented history, at the very least, she is facing a very long time in prison, rendering her unable to harm anyone else. So far, I'm unsure what exactly the plans are by Trooper Martini and others that are involved in Fawn's case in regards to trying to get Heather to, to answer some questions. After all, she was the last person to be living with Fawn. She was the last person to see Fawn before her disappearance because even more so now than before, it's very clear what Heather is willing to do when someone she is trying to control is a attempting to leave her. I know that so many of you are invested in this case. You guys went to Bridget and just overflowed so much love and support when I initially brought this case to you. So I'm sure many of you guys are already aware of what's going on, but for those of you that aren't, I highly suggest you go and follow the Facebook page, Justice for Fawn, to get constant updates. And it's a way to stay on top of things if I'm not able to immediately update you guys. I'm going to be keeping my eye on this. I'm interested to see when her trial is going to start because it appears she's likely going to fight it. Because I genuinely think that she believes that she never does anything wrong, but we'll see how it ends up going. I will keep you guys as updated as I possibly can, but that is all that I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to these new updates. Hopefully it leads to justice for Fawn. If you haven't already, go ahead and hit subscribe button down below to become a part of the Howland fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together or bring them justice together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.